हेलो एवरीवन यशोदिन हियर फ्रॉम वेंचर सेंटर वी आर लाइव ऑन यूट्यूब थैंक यू Good evening, friends, colleagues from the industry and academia, and young aspiring drug development scientists. On behalf of Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative, Indian Society for Clinical Research, and Bayrat Regional Bioinnovation Center, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you in this international workshop on taking novel drugs from lab to clinic concepts and case studies. This five-day workshop has been planned to map the drug discovery and development process of a lead candidate uh, from, to a preclinical drug candidate and then to finally a drug candidate. And uh, the focus of this workshop is going to be small molecules. Uh, we are all very aware of the fact that taking novel drugs from the research lab to the clinic is a very challenging, uh, resource-intensive, time-consuming activity. And we have seen a very small percentage of success in this uh, affair. Um, very few drug candidates actually reach the clinic. Uh, and the, this inability of the potentially important discoveries to actually cross the translational gap, as it is called, is also referred to as the value of death. And uh, this value of death is understood to be the gap between Ben's research and the clinical application. Now, this is the focus area of this workshop. Uh, having said that it is a very difficult process, I would also like to stress that there is, there is definitely a method and a process to drug development and translational research, which if understood well, can greatly increase our chances of success. So it is this backdrop, which uh, this is the backdrop of our workshop, how we have visualized and conceptualized this and are also targeting this area. Now, um, we have tried to incorporate the subject matter, which is critical uh, in supporting a first in human study and, to uh, and have also tried to kind of explain the same through case studies so as to make it more interesting and to give all the participants a actual feel of what drug development exactly is and what are the challenges involved. It's more, uh, more than a bookish uh, knowledge that we are trying to disseminate. We're trying to share with you real life experiences of uh, drug development scientists across board. Uh, so uh, we have a very distinguished panel with us of drug development scientists ranging from biologists, chemists, pharmacologists, veterinary doctors, formulation experts, clinical science, uh, clinicians, uh, who have all helped us to put together this workshop and to uh, help you cover this journey of translational research. Uh, this also actually kind of uh, brings into focus the importance of multidisciplinary collaboration in translational science. Uh, this workshop is a five-day workshop starting today. Uh, it would be for the next five days, we'll have it at the same time every day. The first day is focused on uh, lead optimization. Day two will follow, where, wherein we will talk about pharmaceutical development, followed by day three. Uh, we'll try to bring about the nuances of pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic interactions, safety pharmacology studies. Day four would be uh, focused on toxicology. And finally, day five, the first in human study, our goalpost. 
So that is the whole plan of this workshop as it has been, uh, we have kind of visualized it. We look forward to your very active participation in this workshop on all the five days. And we sincerely hope uh, that we are able to identify and demystify some of the key drug development activities in this uh, very exciting drug development journey that we have. Uh, I would now like to request uh, the representatives of the three collaborating organizations that have conceptualized and put together this workshop to please introduce their respective organization to our participants. Uh, we start with uh, Dr. Kavita Singh, Director, South Asia Drug, Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative. Uh, over to you, Dr. Singh. Thank you so much, Dr. Gitanshri. Um, thank you for that comprehensive uh, summary of what we are going to experience in the next few days. And a very good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for your participation and engagement with us. Uh, we sincerely hope that you find this initiative worthy of your time and all the efforts which have gone behind it. I'll, uh, I will take this opportunity to introduce this very uniquely positioned <clears throat> not-for-profit R&D organization called the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. And in fact, if I share with you, usually when I talk about it to my friends, colleagues or families, uh, the three questions which are immediately asked to me are, uh, how do you define neglected diseases? Uh, which neglected diseases does India work in during its, uh, during when uh, in India? I mean, which diseases does DNDI work for when in India? And how does DNDI does both discovery and development without having direct access to its own labs, without having its own manufacturing, CDM or nothing? There is really no asset or uh, capacity infrastructure we, uh, which DNDI possesses directly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the help of these three most frequently asked FAQs to me when I'm asked about DNDI and share uh, what it is. So... Um, just for those who would not work much in uh, neglected diseases, you would, if you check out, the WHO has quite given uh, clear definitions that these are diverse group of 20 conditions which WHO at this point has identified. This, this is, of course, um, I'm able to change at many times. But at this point, there are 20 conditions that affect the impoverished communities. And many of these diseases, if you see, they are either vector borne or they're associated with complex life cycles. Many of them even don't have the safe and effective treatments for them available. So elimination or control or elimination program is still a wish list. And many of these diseases are usually found in the countries of Asia, Africa, Latin America, uh, which means that they usually do not get the first preference in the attention of large pharma. And globally, while the India has worked on many diseases, shagas, hepatitis C, sleeping sickness, uh, but I'll focus to on India and really want to share um, a contribution which this organization has made to a elimination program of the country, which we call as the Kalazar Elimination Program. A uh, few years back, quite a few years back, we did not have a safe treatment, and there was it was important that somebody tests the options available which could be taken up by a program. So by years of continuous study, long-term follow-ups, DNDI could finally come out with recommendations which were adopted by our national control program to be used for controlling Kalazar or wish release maniasis. And we all know it's been a success story, which India is proud of. And DNDI is happy to have been uh, one of the pillars which made this possible. Going further, while our numbers have dramatically come down, uh, DNDI still feels there is a room to further work on drug development for sustained elimination. As you would understand presently, it's a parental drug. And as the numbers go down, uh, the feasibility of keeping parental drugs at primary health centers would go down. It means we would certainly need oral drugs. So DNDI is not in the next stage, has uh, got approval from Drug Controller India to start trials in phase two to test the efficacy of uh, oral candidates. Uh, in parallel, DNDI has also very recently signed collaboration agreements with DHSTI, is working with ICMR for, again, you would know, a very common disease for which um, we don't have treatments yet available. We do have supportive therapies, but not treatments, and that is dengue, I would like to refer to. And also exploring options of having drugs 
for killing the large worm of lymphatic filariasis. I'm sure many of us are available or are aware of elephantiasis. We must have seen them as children. Many patients, um, as we walk through the corridors of railway station, used to find them very often, if I remember correctly. So those are the areas which the India is working on in India. And my last introduction on how uh, how does DNDI really function without having its own, uh, how does it be a virtual orchestra driver? And a not-for-profit, virtual R&D, uh, maybe I'm sure people who started it much before I joined uh, have set out, have uh, shown a beautiful framework, which is possible. But, and it's a very big answer, you know, the, the mechanisms are huge. It might need another webinar. So just to keep myself short, what I'm going to say is, that uh, it is possible. It's, um, I believe many, many product development partnership organizations have shown it is feasible to do. And you would also remember that uh, track development, whether from a not-for-profit organization or from a for-profit organization, the regulatory standards, expectation guidelines are same. So it means you have to be very aligned to the expectations of any regulatory agencies where you would like for your drug to be uh, registered. So what really helps us uh, aligned missions with our partners. And presently, DNDR has much more than 200 partners um, which builds this organization. And of course, funding, which comes in since there is no mechanism of commercialization yeah. and sales. A lot of funding comes in from large government uh, organizations, uh, scientific agencies. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed that as we go forward, the corporate social responsibility of Indian companies is going to help us there. So with this, I think I'll conclude by, again, thank, thank each one of you. Thank you for our partnerships with, uh, for this, even for this, uh, you will see for this webinar or the series, we have so many partners who have agreed to be there with us and especially thanks to Venture Center and ISCR and all of you for uh, so enthusiastically signing up to be a part of this journey as Gitanjali mentioned for the next five days. Thank you so much, Dr. Gitanjali. Back to you, please. Thank you, Dr. Tavata. Uh, that was indeed a very comprehensive introduction to DNDI. I would now like to request Dr. Sanish Davis. Uh, he's president, Indian Society for Clinical Research and R&D director, Janssen Pharmaceuticals to say a few words and introduce Indian Society for Clinical Research to all the participants. Over to you, Dr. Sanish. Yeah, thank you, uh, Gitanjali, and uh, thank you to uh, DNDI for this opportunity. I'll quickly take uh, for those uh, who are not aware about ISCR, uh, a little bit about what the society stands for and how uh, the society actually uh, wants to do a lot more in the space of, uh, you could say, building up the ecosystem for doing research, especially in research for uh, both neglected diseases, rare diseases, et cetera. So the Indian Society for Clinical Research uh, is an organization which started in India in 2005. It's a professional association of all stakeholders who are involved in clinical research. Uh, and, uh, and essentially, this is, uh, uh, you could say, a, a, a group of uh, individuals as well as associations who are interested in building up the ecosystem for doing clinical research in India. Uh, so you have both the pharmaceutical industry, both the domestic as well as the multinational industry. You have hospitals and academia, along with, of course, a wide number of a large number of individual life members who, who belong to either the clinician, site staff, ethics committee members, patient advocates, as well as those who are involved in research. Uh, ISCR works to ensure that there is widespread awareness of research and, and all of us here would appreciate the fact that it is not just to bring uh, cutting edge science to the country or to whichever country you belong. It's also important that if you have to do research, you need the ecosystem which involves uh, not only the patients uh, who are the most uh, important link or the stakeholder in this whole process, but also the government, the policymakers, uh, the institutions, as well as uh, uh, the overall uh, ancillary supplies, etc. So uh, ISCR becomes the bridge which actually gets in all these people aligned. And we want to ensure that all the diverse stakeholders are working to shape the environment. ISCR works through councils and chapters. So uh, again, uh, uh, I would like to call out the fact that clinical research is not just about uh, doing bench research or uh, you could say uh, research in the lab or even just research in the clinic, 
but it requires a lot of other elements which have to come through uh, if your research has to see the light of the day or if the drug or the molecule has to come to the patient uh, post approval. So all these different elements uh, require capacity building, capacity augmentation, as well as ensuring that they all work uh, in the most beautiful way uh, in, in a harmonized fashion. ISCR's objectives is to shape clinical research landscape in India. We do a lot of advocacy uh, initiatives with uh, government policymakers, uh, and uh, we also have a huge uh, emphasis on patient education through a program called as Now Chetana. Uh, there is a lot of media workshops that are conducted, and of course, uh, uh, capacity building, uh, as everyone would know, uh, is an important key part of, uh, you could say, the, the whole ecosystem buildup. We also have an exclusive program for academia, which is called as Academic Consortium for Clinical Research in India, which exclusively works with academic institutions and uh, is a part and parcel of the whole ISCR program. Uh, in 2021 and 22, we have been uh, very uh, successful in continuing our advocacy. We are bringing in decentralized clinical trials, uh, which is an important part of, you could say, building the ecosystem for virtual studies in India. This would especially be important for rare diseases as well as neglected diseases because the patients are not present in the, the tier one, tier two cities. They are more in the villages, et cetera. For them to come to the sites uh, for a study might be difficult. So we go to them, uh, go, to the, go to the patients to actually do the study. Last year, we actually started with the Translational Research Working Group. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you could say, a direct culmination of that partnership. Uh, we are looking at uh, improving the policy, uh, uh, having advocacy with the government, et cetera. And of course, ISCR works collaboratively with other organizations uh, within uh, India for actually ensuring a better ecosystem is created. We also have a very uh, successful index journal called as Perspectives in Clinical Research. This is the official publication of ISCR in India. So uh, just to end, who can join ISCR? Any working professional associated or working in clinical research, you can be a life member and, and, and can be part and parcel of all the programs uh, that uh, ISCR does to uh, ensure that the ecosystem for clinical research is built up. So thank you once again, DNDI, for the opportunity, and uh, I hand it back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Davis. Um, and thank you uh, for, your, for collaborating with DNDI also. Uh, I now request Dr. Premnath, Director, Venture Center, to please uh, say a few words introducing his organization to the participants. Um, yes, uh, I'm having a little difficulty sharing my screen, so I'm just trying to see if... Uh, Okay, I'm sorry about that. Let me just do it verbally. Uh, first, uh, I'll you... I'll I'll share it for you. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me get started. Uh, first of all, greetings everybody, and uh, thank you for joining in. This promises to be a really uh, interesting workshop, and I'm grateful uh, uh, to DNDI for initiating this, and we're very happy to be participating and contributing to this uh, uh, workshop as well. Uh, Smita, would you go full screen? Okay, so yeah. uh, first of all, uh, the Bayrak Regional Bio Innovation Center is uh, uh, is some is a, a center that Venture Center hosts. Uh, it is associated with Bayrak and one of the few uh, regional bio regional centers that Bayrak has set up. Bayrak is an arm of the Department of Biotechnology, Government of uh, India. Uh, the focus in uh, um, this particular regional bio innovation center. Uh, Smita, can you go to the next slide? Hello? Uh, yeah, I have moved the slide. No, sorry, it's not moving. So perhaps we can just uh, escape out and keep it on. Uh... Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, so the bio, uh, the Bayrak bio, uh, Regional Bio Innovation Center has a few specific uh, set of activities which are listed out here in the slide that you see right now. 
Uh, it's primarily focused on creating awareness, building capacity of individual startups and incubators and mentoring innovators working on technology translation and entrepreneurship in the life sciences uh, uh, sector. And this we do through a variety of different mechanisms. Of course, uh, therapeutics is clearly one of the areas of great interest to the Bayrak Regional Bioinnovation Center. Next slide, please. Let me just quickly tell you about Venture Center. Uh, uh, we are just finishing 15 years of our existence. Next slide, please. This uh, campus uh, is something which you're all welcome to visit some point. Uh, we are one of the largest science business incubators uh, in the country. Uh, we also uh, are home to several national uh, initiatives and an award-winning incubator. Next slide, please. Um, we work on several different themes uh, focused on knowledge-based enterprises. Uh, the themes cover health, um, 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 energy, environment, agriculture, uh, in, uh, engineering, electronics, and so on. But of course, uh, health happens to be our primary focus. Next slide, please. Uh, that uh, we cover through various different domains, including devices, diagnostics, therapeutics, and so on and so forth. We've been working with a lot of different startups, uh, more than 600 startup teams and programs. Um, uh, and at any given time, we host more than 70 startups in the space, a large mentor and experts community, and a lot of different uh, activities under this umbrella. Next slide, please. Uh, we also are home to several startups where uh, it's a very inclusive environment. Um, many of these startups are founded by people trained in the sciences and engineering. 30% uh, of our founders are women founders. Uh, and uh, we work in the earliest stage of startups with especially those which have unique patent families and uh, inventive products. Next slide, please. I just want to briefly leave you with one other slide, uh, which is relating to a task force which we have been hosting uh, during COVID. Uh, so we are the nerve center for a, a task force focus, focused on repurposing of drugs for COVID-19. Uh, and uh, we primarily focused on looking at uh, 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 compiling and providing access to good quality information, multidisciplinary assessment and opinions, uh, some decision frameworks, uh, a retrospective clinical study, and some referrals and connects as well. Uh, and for this, we have uh, put together a team of uh, around 25 odd advisors spanning different disciplines who have been providing inputs uh, to certain arms of the government. So I think with that, I will stop uh, here. Thank you very much again uh, to Dr. Kavita Singh, Gitanjali, Dr. Gitanjali, uh, and DNDI for uh, this opportunity to participate uh, in uh, this international workshop. And I'm looking forward to it as are, I think, all the participants as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Premnath. Um, uh, once again, I would like to welcome all our participants to what we hope will be a very interesting knowledge journey through the realms of translational science. I will now request Mr. Amit Malik, Head of Operations, DNDI Delhi office to please facilitate the scientific session. Over to you, Amit. Thank you, Dr. Gitanjali. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, and I welcome you all to the scientific uh, section of this webinar. Uh, where uh, our distinguished panel of speakers and uh, our esteemed chair would share their experience on framework for successful lead optimization. Um, and this uh, gives me immense pleasure to also introduce our chairperson of the day, uh, Dr. Mona Lisa Chatterjee. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee is an expert in uh, early discovery, having taken uh, molecules from HIT to uh, phase one clinical trials. She has um, she obtained uh, integrated MS and PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And she has over 20 years of rich experience, both in small molecules and biologics discovery and development. Uh, she is also the co-founder co of uh, Sekai Bio uh, Private Limited, which has uh, developed uh, computational workflows for the design of small molecules, peptides and proteins. Currently, she is located in Bangalore and working as an independent uh, consultant. Uh, before uh, I hand over the session to Dr. Chatterjee and uh, our panel of speakers, a small housekeeping announcement for all. I kindly request all the participants to rename their devices, uh, name with their registered name, 
to enable us to generate uh, the participation certificate. Thank you, thank you, everyone. And uh, I hand over to Dr. Chatterjee, please. Thank you, Amit. Uh, thank you for this kind introduction. Delighted to be here. And I sincerely thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity. I welcome you all to the first session of the five-day webinar uh, titled Taking Novel Drugs from Lab to Clinic, Concepts and Case Studies. So today we have a panel, panel of experts with decades of drug discovery experience. They will be sharing with us the approach to early discovery, focusing on the lead optimization phase with real life uh, case studies. Now, as was mentioned, we are ex uh, expecting a diverse audience. So I felt it might be good to cover some very basic definitions. Um, we are talking about drug discovery. What is a drug? And as we all understand in very simple terms, any chemical or a biological compound when administered in our body via any route, uh, via any route uh, reaches the desired site of action and brings about a physiological effect, which is beneficial with, with minimal unwanted side effects. So as you can see, in simple, we have three major attributes. A, right exposure. B, right efficacy or potency, which, relate, which is related to the target it engages. And C, right safety. And most of our early discovery efforts are spent in trying to build, bring all these attributes together in a candidate drug. A second, um, aspect which I felt is uh, worth highlighting is that we initiate a drug discovery program to address a unmet medical need. Now, before we do that, we actually put together something called a target product profile, which is nothing but a list of property attributes, uh, minimal and uh, optimal, that we would like to build in the candidate drug. Now, guided by this target product profile, uh, generally discovery programs are initiated by screening uh, compound libraries against a relevant target or a cell type or an organism. The screening effort then gives us a diverse set of scaffolds, which could potentially be developed into drugs. Through our lead generation process, we sift through these scaffolds, we test them, we understand them, and we prioritize few scaffolds for lead optimization. And lead optimization is a phase where in-depth exploration, chemical exploration around the scaffold is made to build a very robust structure activity relationships, which then allows us to go and identify a candidate. So as you can see, the end, most of our very early discovery is a very close collaborative effort between chemists, biologists, and the DMPK scientists. It is also a very real-time effort. You design compounds, you test them, you analyze them, you learn from them, and you design the next wave. And as Dr. Gitantli said, not all uh, lead optimization programs actually end up in a drug candidate. So with that, I would really like to uh, introduce our first speaker. I welcome Dr. Benjamin Perry. Dr. Perry joined DNDI in April 2015 as project manager of NTD uh, Drug Discovery Booster Project. He's a medicine chemist with 13 years experience con conducting early stage drug discovery across a variety of uh, disease indications that include oncology, autoimmune disorders, and psychiatry. Dr. Perry has held prior research positions at University of Colorado, Celtech, UCB, and Adex Pharmaceuticals. He holds a master's degree in chemistry from University of Wales and a PhD from Imperial College. His talk is titled Overview of Lead Optimization. When the floor is yours, we have 15 minutes and hopefully we'll have five minutes for question and answers. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully put this in presenting mode. Yes, and we see you and hear you very well. 
Excellent. Can you see my extended screen? Oh. Not yet in the presentation mode. Yes, you see it now. You see the full screen? We do see it. Excellent. Okay. So in 15 minutes, <laughs> I will try to give an overview of feed optimization. Um, I think this is an excellent place to start the week's uh, webinar, uh, as I think it uh, essentially ties into a lot of the topics that are going to be talked about later on in the week. Um, what I'm going to try to cover here is, first of all, convince everyone why this idea of lead optimization is important and then give a very high level overview of the very many different moving parts of lead optimization and the sorts of things that we take into consideration during this lead optimization drug discovery process. And I will then deep dive on one very specific thing, which is this idea about uh, a PKPD relationship. And the reason I've picked that as one area I wanted to just highlight is it's one fundamental part of drug discovery and in, and in particular lead optimization that I think uh, often goes overlooked, particularly with a, a, a lot of uh, projects being run uh, by teams that are maybe new to, to drug discovery. It's a fundamental part of the project, but it's something that really an understanding of only comes with a little bit of time. It's absolutely fundamental to, to lead optimization. So I'll touch on that very briefly. What I'm not going to cover is the idea of hit finding. How do we find our starting points? This is uh, worthy of an entire five-day webinar on its own. I'm not going to talk about assay design or how assays run or even how the actual molecules are designed and the, and the, and the changes one would make. This is, again, a very, very deep topic uh, worthy of other uh, discussions. I'm just going to try and convince you that this is an important process. So if we think about where lead optimization sits in the drug discovery or the drug R&D process, you can see here this pipeline view of early stage research on the left through to patient and pills for patients on the right. And this is a, a well-trodden path. Uh, and you'll see these pipelines uh, regularly when we're talking about drug R&D. And lead optimization sits almost right here, almost at the very beginning of this process, not quite at the start, which would be screening and hit to lead, but at, the, at this point at which we're still doing discovery and they're not yet down to a single molecule for preclinical evaluation. Um, so if we think about why this is important, what I've got here is a overview of the drug discovery section. So this is the point where you start looking for a, for, for, for a starting point, for a screen, through to having a clinical candidate. So the left-hand side of that pipeline. And the general process is this. We would screen. Uh, as Dr. Chatterjee just mentioned, maybe look for look for, uh, for, for hit starting points by screening thousands of compounds, usually high throughput screening or other screening efforts. So we would be looking at hundreds of thousands or millions of molecules to find a starting point. And once we have that starting point and we have investigated that starting point thoroughly, we have what we would term a hit. Now, this is a molecule that demonstrates activity in vitro but that is robust and validated. And this robust and validated is really important. It is not just a molecule that has come out of a screen. It is something that has been challenged as to quite how realistic and true that activity is, because there are many, many ways that a hit signal from a screen can actually turn out to be completely false. In fact, more often than not, it can be a false hit. So you, it needs to be robustly validated. If we then have one molecule there as a hit, we would then work very hard to optimize this into a lead, which has many different definitions. Our definition at DNDI, it would be that this is a molecule that demonstrates efficacy in an in vivo setting rather than an in vitro setting. Uh, or alternatively, you could replace that in vivo by, for example, an advanced in vitro, uh, an advanced in vitro assay. And then we take that lead and we optimize it even further. And now we're looking for a molecule that not only demonstrates efficacy in vivo, but is also suitable for preclinical evaluation. And in a normal project, you might have one or two hits, one or two molecules that you can classify as leads coming out of this, uh, uh, from the first effort. And then ideally, anywhere between one and five molecules at the end of this that you can classify as optimized leads. And these would then go into further evaluation, which my other colleagues in, during this, this week's uh, webinar are going to talk about in more depth to turn these into preclinical candidates and clinical candidates. 
Now, the reason I'm showing this is because if we actually think about this process, this is where lead optimization sits. It's this process of turning a lead into an optimized lead. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit briefly about the hit to lead process because they are quite similar and quite related. And if we think about the activity we're doing here, it is exploring around the chemical space. It is taking the molecule and it is making changes to the molecule to understand what those change, what impact those changes have, and hopefully impact that molecule for the better, making the molecule more potent, understanding its structure activity relationship, but also understanding its potential to be a drug. Because most molecules have no chance of being a drug. You have to tune your molecule, tune your compound into something that has, the, has a profile that will enable it to behave as a drug. And once we have that, we also ha have that to, 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 to generate our lead. We have to think about other things. We have to think about how we can make it safe. What kind of doses are we talking about? So lead optimization is this process of taking a molecule that's got the efficacy that we want and turning it into something that can have a predicted human dose that's in line with the target product profile, as Dr. Chatterjee mentioned just now. So this is a lot of profiling and tweaking. And the reason I'm showing these figures over here on the right, uh, really hopefully is this is, the, this is the information that shows why it's really important to spend time here. These are expensive processes. We would be making hundreds of compounds in hit to lead and thousands of compounds in lead optimization on a particular project. And if you look at the costs, we're talking in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And these costs are costs, are what I would classify as global cost costs. This number would be much higher if everything was being done in the United States or in Europe, and it might be lower if it was being done entirely in Asia. But at the NDI particularly, we have our project teams scattered across the world. So this is an, a global average. So still very expensive process over about a year. And then the lead optimization, again, millions of dollars over a couple of years to be able to do this work. Now, that's a lot of, that's a lot of resource. But if you then look further down this pro, further down this pipeline, you'll start to see that when we're hitting clinical trials and preclinical candidate evaluations, again, we're talking single digit millions for each of these processes. But then once we're in the clinic, it's tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. We're going to spend an enormous amount of money, where an enormous amount of resource when we get to this point in the process. And so this is why lead optimization is absolutely important because up here it's as much smaller amount of money that's being spent to ensure that the molecules that come down here are as good as we can make them so we're not wasting this money. You know, this is a fundamental fact. Most drug discovery projects will fail. Most R&D projects will fail, not because of the quality of the people or the scientists doing the work, but because fundamentally it is not in many cases not possible to optimize a hit into a lead or a lead into a drug-like molecule. Most of them will fail. And so for me, the really key point about lead optimization and what the, what the role of lead optimization, it's effectively twofold. It is to find those poor projects, the ones that are going to fail at some point and stop them as soon as possible so that we're not pushing them all the way into the clinic and then wasting money and wasting resource and wasting, wasting people's time trying to, uh, trying to work on a molecule that has no chance of succeeding. And in the case that when we do have a project then that, that, has a, that, can, that can make it all the way through to patients, we ensure that it has the best possible chance in the clinic. We minimize waste of resources at the clinical stage. And this for me is the, the whole role of lead optimization. So if we think about what this actually looks like, this is an example from a project at DNDI that we were looking at a couple of years ago for Leishmania. And I've got over here the hit to a mid-stage hit through to a lead molecule. And I'm showing you here that the process that we go through. So this is uh, efficacy against a parasite. And obviously this is a, an IC50, this, the lower this number, the lower this concentration, the better. And we start off with a molecule that's not very potent. And you can see this plot on the bottom. What I have here, this is a time on the x-axis versus potency on the y-axis. Okay, so the, the lower this number, the better the molecule. And I've also colored each of these dots. So each of these points is a molecule that we design and make uh, over time. And these are colored by, in this case, microsomal stability in mouse. This is, the, uh, this is a value that shows you how likely your molecule is to be metabolized, in this case, in a mouse. We're looking for low numbers here. We want the molecules to be stable when exposed to a living system. So we want things that are green. So ideally, we're looking for molecules that are low down here on the y-axis and green. And at the start, we have a molecule that's green, but it's very high up here. It's not very potent. This is our starting point. And we run some optimization and we eventually find this molecule after about 30 or 40 compounds, we've now got something that is clearly demonstrably much more potent and it's still quite stable. You can see it's this molecule here. So we've gone from tens of micromolar 
to low single digit micromolar and still moderate microsomal stability. This line here, the in vitro clearance, this is the uh, human, rat and mouse. And you can see that we've, we're still quite low. These are relatively good values. But then we continue our optimization process. We continue making molecules. You'll see that most of the molecules we've made here are not active. We are making 80%, 90% of the molecules inactive at this point, you can see, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's important to understand what we can't do. It's as important to understand what changes we can't make as it is to understand what changes we can make. But importantly, we're still making uh, breakthrough molecules. And slowly but surely, over time, we start to get down to very interesting molecules here where we have compounds that are now quite potent and also quite stable. And this is our lead or our optimized lead. Uh, and you can see it here on the right hand side. It's potent against its target. It is stable in most species. And importantly, this compound then goes on to demonstrate efficacy in vivo. And we then continue making molecules. We continue making molecules. We make more and more molecules that are potent. You can see we have fewer compounds that are flatlining at the top here and more and more compounds that are, that are potent. That's because we now understand what's needed to make the molecule potent as well as optimization. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, we, we have a really nice package of compounds to work on. So key question is, why didn't we stop here in the middle? Why didn't we stop at this point when we had a compound that, was good, that, that looked like it might be good enough? Well, that is because in lead optimization, we have to optimize many, many different things. We are not just looking at potency and metabolic stability. Here's a, an incomplete list of things that we try to optimize in lead optimization. A whole host of Edmary parameters, including permeability, different types of stability, including plasma and hepatocyte stability, protein binding. We need to optimize for its pharmacokinetics, how quickly it's eliminated. Uh, it does, how does this work in different species? What happens if we go for multiple doses? Many, many different things that need to be optimized. Likewise, there are, po there are elements of potency that we want to look at. We obviously want it to be potent against our biological target and in our in vivo models and maybe in our modeling uh, phenotypic assays, but we also want it to be selective. We don't want it to be active against other targets that might be closely related that could cause off-target toxicity or other problems. We have to understand how the molecule is working in terms of mechanism of action. We need to think about resistant strains if that's relevant to our disease area. We need to think about whether it can generate resistance again if applicable, and a whole host of other things in potency and the potency area that we need to understand. Physical chemical elements, <laughs> what is the physical, what are the physical properties of our molecules? How easy is it to make our molecules? Um, what is the, so, what the solubility profile of our molecules? And again, a, a, a big list of things that need to be optimized here and a huge range of toxicology and safety markers that need to be optimized against. Again, an incomplete list, but you can see that all of these different parameters have to be modulated. And by making changes to our compound, we can impact each and, one of, each and every one of these. And it takes a long time to get to the point where we have a molecule that looks as good as possible in all of these different areas. Um, and I'll just quickly show uh, what that actually looks like. This is an example from um, last week, in fact, where we, were able, where we nominated a molecule in a, a DNDI project looking at COVID. We nominated some candidates last week. Um, these are compounds that have progressed into preclinic. And you can see here that we, we grouped together a set of five molecules with a whole host of different profile um, uh, elements to its profile, pharmacokinetics and, and ADME, physical properties, potencies, safety. And we've tested most of these compounds in many of these different studies. And we build up this large profile, lots of different assays against each molecule and look at the four or five compounds that look the best or in other, uh, another way of looking at this, the least worst, because it's almost impossible to get an absolutely perfect molecule and pick the best compounds to progress forward into the preclinical stage. So there are lots and lots of different parameters that we need to look at here. It is not just potency. Um, I've one, highlighted one here that I think is quite important, which is this idea about predicted dose. We mentioned earlier the idea of the target product profile. We know what kind of dose we think that uh, the clinicians need to be able to work with the patient with the patients for the particular disease we're interested in. It's important to be able to predict what that dose is going to be. And that comes from a number of different parameters that you see on here, the pharmacokinetics, the ADME, and the potency all come together into this space. And this is a really important point. And this is the one thing I wanted to, to concentrate on here about, about when we're thinking about optimizing. One question that comes up uh, time and time again is, well, how potent? 
how much potency is enough potency? And this ties to back uh, into this idea of the pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic relationship. Um, we need to think about potency with in regard to the exposure in the pharmacokinetics of the molecule. So it's not just an absolute potency in our in vitro assay, but also how that potency plays relative to the exposure that we see when administered, administered to, a, 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 um, in this case, a mouse or to a, a living system. This is the PKPD relationship. How does that in vitro potency relate to pharmacokinetic exposure and impact the pharmacodynamics, so the output in the in vivo efficacy? Now, this is important. This is disease model specific. Sometimes it's target specific, and it can even be series specific, the way that that relationship plays out. Um, and this is something that needs to be unraveled during the lead optimization process. So as you're making molecules and testing and generating PK data on the best molecules and running molecules through the in vivo efficacy studies, it's really important to think about all of these pieces and how they play together. To put it very simply, exposure levels really need to be in line with your in vitro measurements in order to expect to see an effect in vivo. Okay, if they're not, then there's probably something strange afoot. Um, I've seen recently calls for in vivo efficacy when published in uh, peer reviewed journals to, in, to, fun, to, to uh, as a baseline, also be accompanied by a pharmacokinetic plot. Otherwise, it's effectively useless. I'm going to give an example as to how this ties up. This is from a paper that came out two or three months ago. Again, another COVID-19 example. This is from a company called Shinogi in Japan, where they've generated this fun, phenomenal molecule that is just about to finish phase three trials for COVID-19. Um, it's a great looking molecule. It looks like it's uh, likely to be very efficacious, but this demonstrates perfectly this idea of the PKPD relationship. So it's in vitro potency is here. Um, it's about 350 nanomolar as a, as a, as a molecule, which is pretty acceptable potency. This is in a cell-based assay against SARS-CoV-2. We know its plasma protein binding is 90%. This is something that's measured in lead up. It is how tightly that molecule binds to plasma proteins. In plasma, most of the molecule, 90% of it is attached to plasma proteins and therefore not available to impact its target, which means that the concentration that we need to achieve in plasma is effectively 10 times this, which is about three and a half micromolar, which translates to 2000 nanograms per ml. So we should not expect to see efficacy with this molecule in an animal unless its exposure is around about this level. Here you can see the PK of this compound uh, in a number, of a number of different doses. As you increase the dose, you increase the exposure. So this is time, this is exposure. This is the same plot of, uh, of, of PK, but with Two, with 12-hour uh, in, uh, in interval dosing, so re redosing 12 hours afterwards, so you see this slight accumulation. And you can see this black dotted line here is this plasma-adjusted IC50. It's this 2,000 nanograms per ml. And so you can see that at the 2 milligrams per kilogram, this molecule, 50% of the time, it's exposed enough to be having an effect on the virus, and the other 50% of the time, it's not. At the next dose up, 8 mg per kg, just here at around about the 12 hour mark, it dips under the IC50. And importantly, the next light blue line here constantly is over that plasma adjusted EC50. It's always exposed over the EC50. And this is the efficacy output from that study. And you can see that the yellow compared to the blue, very small amount, about a 50% efficacy with this compound when you have this slight dip below the exposed level. Whereas when you are consistently across, that exposure, you have full effect. So this molecule has a very clear PKPD relationship. The molecule needs to constantly be above the EC50. If you don't, you will not see not perceive particularly high efficacy in an in vivo setting. It's important to understand how this how this ties in to all uh, to your series, and it is going to be series or at least target specific. So in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, jump over that last slide, and I will just reiterate what I've tried to convey to you here. Lead optimization is important. We are maximizing the chance of our molecule succeeding in the clinic. Without, it is the best place to invest here. The best place to invest is in, at this point because it is going to be much more expensive to fail further down the line. Hopefully I've given you a little overview of the different moving parts of the lead optimization and just this little bit of information on this idea of a PKPD relationship, which I think is fundamental, or one of the fundamental pillars of the lead optimization process. And I will stop there.
thank you and I'm happy to answer questions if we have time and if not this is my email address you're more than welcome to contact me with questions if we run out of time well, thank you, Ben. It was an amazing thing to cover lead optimization. And it almost looks impossible that we can ever get a drug to move into clinical candidate phase. Uh, there are some very uh, uh, quick clarifications. If you can, somebody asks, is there something called, what is series specific? Uh, uh, great question. Can I answer that? Is that okay? Yes, time? yes. We that's have that, five that, minutes, so we can take that, that's, that's, an, that's an excellent question. And I'm a chemist. So for me, the, I, this is, it, it, it's, it's, it's immediately obvious, but I understand that that's not immediately obvious. So a, a, a series will be when you have a, a, a set of molecules that are all based around the same chemical scaffold. So they all originate from each other. So you start with a hit and the hundreds or thousands of molecules that you may make around that could be considered to be all around the same series. Now, there are examples. Uh, personally, I've worked on these and, and seen this happen where you can hit the same target, the same biological target with two very, very different types of chemical structure. And I've seen examples where, although we are absolutely certain that the two different series are interacting at the same point on the, on, on the target protein, their, pharma, their PKPD relationships are completely different and driven by different aspects of the, uh, of, uh, of the lead optimization profile. And it's very important to, to realize that. It doesn't always happen, particularly in infectious disease, I would say it's almost disease model specific. As in, you know, you, we can say, for example, that in order to have an effect in uh, a chronic trypanosoma cruzi model, you have to have exquisite uh, exposure, multiple fold exposure over the IC50 with every single series. Um, then with very few, with no currently no known exceptions. But in many cases, it can be series specific, where in particularly in in, in psychiatry and in um, neurodegeneration CNS disorders, particularly, I've seen this. While we wait for more questions to come in, I had a quick uh, clarification, something that you can shed yeah, light on. on okay, so yeah, so we have uh, discovery uh, screening approaches which are target based, and we have screening which approaches where we do not know the target, and we are trying to understand basically go by what is called as a phenotypic screen, where we have an activity on a cell type. How does your lead optimization program differ? Or what are the challenges when you deal with one versus another? Again, great question. So at DNDI, we work almost exclusively with phenotypic, and it works very, very well for infectious diseases. And I think that we're seeing, even outside of that area, more and more of a return to this idea of phenotypic approaches. Uh, if you look at some of the uh, approaches that we see, for example, in neurodegeneration and Alzheimer's, where we're thinking about a macro effect uh, in terms of amyloid plaque, for example. Um, if phenotypic is very, very interesting. It is more challenging because the design aspect from a medicinal chemistry point of view can be more complex because you have to optimize, you're optimizing without knowing the structure, without knowing the target. So you have, you, you are a little bit blind, which means you have to take a slightly different mentality of uh, there's sort of a very empirical mentality. You'll probably make more molecules that are not potent than you will make molecules that are potent. Um, if you're working with the target, you might be able to use structure guided design, particularly if you're working with kinases and you can get access to X-ray crystallography. There are some phenomenal cutting edge tools that allow you to really help on the design, which makes things go faster. Um, but if you're working on a target, your molecule has further hurdles to go through to get efficacy in the next step because it's wonderful. It's okay, fine being very potent, exquisitely potent against you know, an intracellular kinase, but if your molecule doesn't get into the cell, then it's not going to have any efficacy where it needs it. So different challenges, different approaches, both completely valid, in my opinion. Thank you. And there is a question which I'll modify a little bit. Uh, there's a question about computational approaches. How does in silico design or in silico approaches impact hit identification, but I think I'll tailor it more to lead optimization. I think it's a useful tool to have alongside the medicinal chemists. I think that we are still, I, I, would, I would love to be able to say that this is something that we're a couple of years away from having an entirely automated in silico process and we will no longer need to make molecules in the lab. And I think that that's a, not, impossible, but we are certainly decades, if not centuries away from that in my view. So it's important to remain experimental and to work with computational uh, chemists and computational approaches to be able to uh, augment the experimental side of things. 
many times the most powerful models, in my opinion, in computational are models that are built specifically alongside for a particular target. And that's where it can become really very, very helpful and very powerful. And obviously, if there are structured guided elements of the project as well, then computation plays an incredibly important role. But as a general one rule fits all in silico approach, I think that we're a long way away from that yet. But we need to keep trying and need to keep including that sort of approach in all our projects because that's the only way we're going to successfully build better models. No, that, that's really good. And I think that the, the complete approach, which is changing now is AI ML driven approaches. We see some very interesting development, both in uh, data collations, data analysis, multi-parametric analysis. However, we are a little bit away, I would say, if you say the entire discovery process can become in silico. I don't know, Ben, if you agree to that. But, but there are some very interesting uh, advancements that could be of interest to this community. One more question that's come in, which is again something uh, which is quite um, a constant thought process in the field, is can we replace animal studies with other ex vivo system? And one of the examples that has been quoted here is the hollow fiber model. I think that there are that um, there are examples where this is uh, useful, and we should be always striving to do try to do this. Um, I think that we're still a long way from removing that entirely um, from uh, the experimental part of, of R&D uh, in drug discovery. But again, the more we try and more we, the more we try to find alternative approaches, uh, the sooner we're going to get to the point where we no longer have to use uh, these systems. Um, and I think that I think there, there are examples where this plays a role and in certain disease areas, it's maybe, a little more straightforward than others. Uh, to, to, to be, again, it comes back to this idea of the PKPD relationship. If you're fortunate enough to be working in a space where there's a very solid, a well understood disease specific PKPD, then arguably you don't have to use the animal studies that, uh, as, as often, or at least keep them off the critical path. Um, yes, I, I think that there are, and there are also obviously in silico approaches that are coming on board to help uh, at least minimize the use uh of the in vivo setting but i think that we're still a way away from complete removal of that and of course it's part of the regulatory requirements for us to be able to move to human so it's so i think um in the interest of time ben uh, you would have loved to continue asking more questions but thank you so much and uh, we will move to the next speaker thank you ben thank you very much um our next speaker is Professor Ian Gilbert, a Professor of Medicinal Chemistry and Head of Biological Chemistry and Drug Discovery, University of Dundee. Professor Gilbert's research interests are in design and synthesis of potential new therapeutic agents and computational chemistry approach to drug discovery. His work makes extensive use of molecular modeling to guide synthetic efforts. He's also interested in unraveling mode of action uh, deconvolution of molecular targets for phenotypic hits, especially in the area of neglected infectious diseases. His prior roles have been reader, senior lecturer, lecturer in medicinal chemistry, Cardiff University. Professor Gilbert will try to um, explain the lead optimization process through uh, multiple case studies. Welcome, Professor Gilbert, and over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hopefully you can see the uh, yes. full screen. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so thank you for the uh, invitation to speak to you today and for the um, opportunity to talk about some of the work uh, that we've been doing. So I'm going to talk about a, a program that we carried out at the Drug Discovery Unit at the University of Dundee, um, which led to the, the development of a multi-stage preclinical candidate for the treatment of malaria. So just sort of uh, to let you know where Dundee is, because it's um, uh, it's a small city up that's based, uh, that's in the east coast of Scotland. It's about an hour's drive uh, north of Edinburgh. It's uh, located on the banks of the River Tay, which is one of the biggest rivers in the UK. And this is the, uh, the School of Life Sciences. Dundee is famous for the, the discovery, which is the boat that Scott sailed to the Antarctic on when he uh, made his trips to uh, explore the South Pole. 
and this is the um, School of Life Sciences. So the, <clears throat> the Drug Discovery Unit was founded in 2005, and what we wanted to do was to uh, combine the excellence that you find in sort of basic fundamental biology within the university sector with uh, um, the expertise you get from, from industrial drug discovery. So we uh, pulled together a drug discovery unit that has um, uh, an industry experience team. So we now got about 130 people. Um, and that's from um, people come from a number of companies like, such as AstraZeneca and Merck. So we're not a very typical academic group. We, rather than having separate research groups for chemistry and biology, et cetera, we have an integrated drug discovery teams um, where we have teams of chemists, biologists, pharmacologists all working together as, uh, as um, Ben has also talked about the importance of this um, interdisciplinarity. <clears throat> we're not aiming to um, compete with the pharmaceutical industry, but to complement it. And we've got two main areas, um, neglected infectious diseases. So things like uh, malaria and Chagas disease. And then we also have another area called the innovative targets portfolio, which is um, for looking at new ways of tackling major diseases. So that it be instructed to show what, what needs to be pulled together, um, whether it's uh, in one place or through collaboration in terms of doing drug discovery. So this is the setup we have and, uh, <clears throat> and um, allows us to go from sort of developing a screen or an assay through to a preclinical candidate. So uh, we have various ways of selecting things to come into our portfolio or projects. Um, this would be, uh, and that very much depends from project to project. This is what we have for, uh, typically for an, a neglected disease is where we're doing a target. We look to see what's, how valid the target is. Can you make small molecule drug-like molecules to inhibit it? Can you develop assays, et cetera? We do most of our screening using 384 well um, uh, plate formats, using robotics, um, and we've, we've used high content imaging. We also do some fragment screening using X-ray crystallography and NMR screening. We've put together some compound sets for, for screening. So these are about 200,000 compounds. Most of them are a diverse set of compounds, but some of them are, are, are set around particular target classes. So for example, kinase is, and some of them are fragments for fragment-based discovery. As Ben said, you can screen either using against targets, enzymes, or against cells, and we do both. Actually, one of the things that's really surprised me is how, much, how important data management is to make sure that the data that you capture is attached to the right molecule. We've got medicinal and computational chemistry to help the drug design process. We've got structural biology, in vitro models. And one of the things that was most critical in helping us go forward was having the, the drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics in-house. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our, our story, a project that we did on malaria. So why do we need uh, new drugs to, uh, to um, tackle malaria? So there's um, a resistance occurring to first-line anti-malarial. So the main malaria drug used for treating malaria is an artemisinin in combination treatment, and they're starting to see resistance to that occurring um, in multiple places over the world. And medicines for malaria venture, the people we did this project in collaboration with that want a single dose cure, so you just have one tablet. Um, <clears throat> there needs to be medicines for vulnerable populations like children and pregnant women, and that actually requires a, a, a little more um, work in terms of doing the clinical package. And then clearly we want to stop malaria and eradicate it. Um, so there needs to be drugs that are, are capable of helping to do that. So those that block transmission can prevent people getting malaria in the first place and stopping the relapse due to Vivax malaria. So I'm going to run through a little bit on, on how we got into this. So uh, we developed an assay that, uh, for the malaria parasites. This is the whole parasite. And as Dr. Chetan, he said, this is a phenotypic screen. Um, we used, uh, developed a cyber green assay, we, which is a colorimetric assay, and we checked that with a, with a radiometric assay to make sure that both of them uh, were aligned. 
we had a library of about 4,700 compounds. And these were the compounds that were designed to be scaffolds that would inhibit uh, the uh, protein kinases. So we screened this library at three micromolar against the, the, the parasite, which causes ma malaria. And then anything that was had an inhibition of greater than 70%, we took out and did a, um, uh, a um, more detailed investigation. So the first thing is to check that it really is the compound we thought it was, so check its purity and identity, and then confirm it with a 10-point potency curve. We then clustered the hits we had into, to, into series of what looks the same, and that gave us right, that gave rise to 11 series. We then went back to Medicines for Malaria Bench, who'd funded the screen, and it turned out they were already working on seven of those screens or had worked on them. So that left us four. One of those series dropped out very quickly. So we had three series to work on. We didn't know how those compounds worked. So as Ben said, um, you know, we had we don't have a, a target to to work against. So MMV have these compound progression criteria, which tells you what a compound needs to look like at every stage in their drug discovery process. And that's what we use to drive the project. So we had three series, which we called MMV 02, 03, and 04. And these are the criteria that MMV had for what's a valid hit. So this is activity against the parasite, less than one micromolar, uh, activity against the mammalian cell line, we used MRC5s that was greater than 100-fold um, molecular weight less than 500 and the lipophilicity, C log P less than 5. This, we've traffic light colored them as Ben did. Um, so these are <coughs> um, where it's green we, we was okay and where it's amber is where we need attention. So um, MMV03 series, we had a look at, we made and, and bought in quite a lot of compounds and couldn't make any progress with this at all. So we dropped that series. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about these other two series, MMV02 and MMV04. So this was the structure of MMV02. So it had a reasonable starting potency against uh, malaria parasite, about 0.25 micromolar. We need to ideally shift that by a hundredfold. It had um, reasonable selectivity, but it was still quite lipophilic. And it's got lots of aromatic rings, as you can see. And aromatic rings are bad for drugs, lots of aromatic rings, because they tend to um, decrease the solubility and um, make the compound uh, give rise to developability problems, make it metabolically unstable. So our initial goal was to reduce the number of aromatic rings. And it also inhibited enzymes called cytochrome P450s. And cytochrome P450s are involved in metabolism of compounds. And if you block them, you can get rise to drug-drug interactions, which is obviously not a good thing. So we did some heat expansion. And one of the first molecules we made was this one. And this turns out to have, was published about the same time by both GSK and Novartis. We did a bit more work and came up with this, this compound. And as you can see, we've now cut, reduced the number of aromatic rings to three, which is much more reasonable number of, of, of aromatic rings. But And we've got a roughly similar potency and selectivity. And the lipophilicity has come down by a whole log unit. So this was a good start. We did a bit more work and came up with this compound, which is slightly more potent, had a slightly better window to human cells. It's lipophilicities in a region we like to be in. So between one and three are good lipophilicities to be in. Um, it's quite stable to microsomes. So it's not metabolized by phase one metabolism. It's got good solubility. And as Ben talks about protein binding is relatively low. We took this into a mouse efficacy study and it had a, an ED90 of 12 milligrams per kilogram. So that's the amount of dose required to drop the parasite level by 90%. What was really exciting about this was actually the, the speed at which this compound killed the, the parasites and removed the parasites. It was about as um, a similar order to the artemisinins, which are very fast acting drugs. And so we were very excited by this. But the compound, the compound, we also looked at the different life cycle stages of the compound. We looked at it in the liver stages and the gametocyte stages, as well as the blood stage. And it was much less active on this. So this compound is very specifically active against the blood stages. 
we were very excited about this. However, it had two problems. So the inhibited the cytochrome P450s, which we, I've already told you, which gives, potentially gives rise to drug-drug interactions. And it also inhibited a channel called the HERG channel, which is associated with cardiotoxicity. So you, you, you definitely can't have that. So we needed to solve those problems. So the inhibition of cytochrome P450s was due to this pyridine group, so that nitrogen. So we, we did a lot of chemistry to try and replace this pyridine and to remove the um, inhibition of the cytochrome P450. So for example, if you put blocking groups either side of this ni nitrogen, you remove the inhibition of the cytochrome P450. However, we also lost a lot of activity. Despite a lot of work, we couldn't remove this um, inhibition of cytochrome P450. This other substituent here, we couldn't very, do very much with. And this substituent here, the R2 substituent, we're able to make some changes to improve the physicochemical properties of the molecule, like solubility, but we couldn't improve the potency. So in the end, we had to stop this project because we couldn't overcome the problems. And it's knowing when to stop a project is very important because you can waste a lot of time if you don't stop at the right time. So what about the other series? So this series, and um, th this was our starting point. It, um, um, and what I've done is again, green is, is good, yellow is moderate and red is bad. So this compound had moderate activity against the parasite. It had um, a poor solubility and it was very unstable to microsomes. And we thought the problem with this was it was too lipophilic. So it's log P is about four. So we replaced the bromine with a fluorine and that lost us quite a bit of lipophilicity. And then this pyridine with a with the pyrrolidine. And um, we started to get compounds with much better solubility and much better stability, although the um, activity against the parasite slightly decreased. We then replaced this phenyl group with this morpholine that gave us even lower log P, much better solubility, much better stability, metabolic stability, and we now ha had much better potency. This compound had appropriate pharmacokinetics to allow us to take it into a mouse model of infection. So we took this into a mouse model of infection. It um, showed efficacy when dosed of 15 milligrams per kilogram for four days. So this was what's, what's called an early lead. And as Ben said, this is essentially just showing um, in vivo efficacy. However, the, for a malaria compound, you want one that's orally bioavailable. This had very low oral bioavailability. So we went through the process of, of optimizing. So we looked to optimize its potency, its selectivity, its pharmacokinetics and its safety. And we came up with this compound, which had a very good activity against the malaria parasite, very good oral bioavailability and good efficacy. For um, a drug discovery project, particularly one in malaria, you need a very short, efficient synthesis. So the synthesis for this compound that we used was, was uh, just four steps because um, you need to have a very cheap cost of goods for a disease like malaria because most of the people who have malaria have no money to pay for it. Or, um, so uh, the aim is to get a treatment that costs about one US dollar. So this was a, a nice, simple synthetic route to, to get to that molecule. It's important to understand the profile of the compound. And these are some of the things that we measured. So the lipophilicity, so the experimental log D is two and a half. Um, it's, uh, we looked at its stability, uh, sorry, it's protein binding in different species, mouse, rat, dog, and human. Um, and, and as Ben said, it's, you know, this can be an important measure. We looked at its solubility in various media. So this is in simulated gastric fluid, so the sort of fluid that you'd find in, in the stomach, and then in the um, simulated intestinal fluid, either with fed or fasted, with it slightly changed, and it was very soluble. And solubility in drug discovery cannot be underestimated and understated. The compound was permeable, so it can get across membranes. It was stable in simulated gastric fluid, which is important. You don't want it breaking down in the, in the stomach. And it was uh, stable in blood and plasma. And uh, it didn't show significant inhibition of cytochrome P450s. It had good oral pharmacokinetics. So this is a, a trace showing the, the whole blood concentration against time. 
And from a malaria compound, you need a very, very long half-life. This is one of the biggest challenges with, with doing drug discovery for malaria because you need to keep your drug level above the, the level required to kill parasites for a whole week. And if you want to do it with one dose, that's got to last for a whole week. So you need a long half-life. And a half-life in rodents, we had about 20 hours. And that usually when you go from rodents to, to humans, the half-life goes longer and it had a very good oral bioavailability. So this allowed us to go into an efficacy study. So this is an efficacy study, again, using this, this is a, a skid model of, of malaria. From that, we could calculate that ED90 was less than one milligram per kilogram. And this is the minimum parasitidal concentration, which is 10 to 12 nanograms per mil. And we knew we had to keep uh, a compound above that for a week. So the malaria parasite has a complicated life cycle. So when somebody is bitten by a mosquito, the parasites first invade the liver. And our compound was, was very active against the liver stage. So it's had an EC50 there of about one nanomolar. We've talked about its activity against the blood stage. And then it changes to another form called the gametocytes that, and, and various other forms that are involved in onwards transmission into mosquitoes. And our compound was active against these stages of a similar level. So this is remarkably good about this compound. It has the potential for prote protection of malaria by hitting the liver stages, treatment by the blood stages, and prevention of transmission by blocking the transmission stages. And then just to finish, we wanted to know how the compound worked. So this was what we did with Columbia University and the Sanger Center. So they generated resistant parasites and did whole genome sequencing. And the mode of action turns out to be involved in protein synthesis. So in protein synthesis, you have the messenger RNA, you have a ribosome, and um, you get the um, growing peptide chain transfer from one bit of tRNA to another. And after this, the ribosome gets moved along the messenger RNA, and it's by this protein called translation elongation factor two, and that's what our compound blocks. <clears throat> so what's happened to it now? <clears throat> so it's been taken on by the German company Merck, <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's proceeding through uh, clinical trials, and we're really excited to see what happens to it now. Um, and uh, um, as it progresses through this, this process, it's still a long way to go, but it's very exciting to see what's happening. So as several of the speakers have said, drug discovery is, is a, a massive undertaking. You need a large team of people, and this gives you an indication of the number of people that are involved in this project. Um, and uh, we've got very good support from MMV, Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, the NIH, and the European Union. And um, you know, particularly with, with MMV. And this was the core group of us in Dundee who were involved in the project. And I'd like to stop now and thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a really nice uh, journey, I would say. Uh, we have one question uh, while others are typing in. The question is, can you shed more light on comparability of PK of, of compounds in small animals, rodents or rabbits? How does that get translated to uh, humans, if I am? Okay, well, the, <clears throat> so this is a sort of a bit beyond me. You really need to talk to a pharmacokinetics, but there's various models for predicting what PK, how PK extrapolates from rodents or um or other animals into humans. And um, you need to get a, a sort of... Um, large data package around to start to, to make those predictions. Um, but it, it's a very important thing to do early on to make sure that, that uh, the, the dose that you, your compound, you predict your compound have is, is one that's feasible for people to use. Thank you. Uh, one more question is, was resistance emergence considered in any of these programs as you are doing lead optimization? Yeah, so, I mean, I think in, in virtually any infectious diseases, <laughs> resistance is, is a problem. It's more acute in some than others, but resistance is, is, is always a, a massive challenge. Um, 
I mean, we've seen it with COVID recently and that, or resistance or mutations um, and, and HIV and TB, malaria. So in malaria and in TB, for example, it's using combinations of drugs is, is, is what people have done. So if you use combinations of, uh, of drugs, you're, you're making it harder uh, or slowing down the rate of res which resistance can develop because the parasite or, or pathogen has to become res resistant to two things simultaneously. Um, it's, it's, so yeah, resistance is something you need to worry about. <clears throat> MMV is, has, has introduced, uh, recently published a paper and talking about you know, ways to, to try and understand resistance, but it's something we don't fully understand by any means, but it's something you definitely need to keep an eye on. Thank you so much. One quick clarification by uh, I, my chat box is getting populated with questions is, you mentioned two things. You mentioned a TPP, we are looking at one dose cure, right? Yeah. So the malaria, in malaria field at least, the TPPs have really emerged and become yeah. uh, more and more ambitious as we have got better drugs in place. Um, yeah. Second, uh, so if you can shed a little bit light on how you have seen the field emerging. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, MMV, <clears throat> well, in terms of malaria, I've got to talk about malaria really, is you know, MMV have been really good in terms of putting together the, the drug discovery path, you know, what, what assays you need to progress your compound and what sort of activities you need to be looking at in those, those different assays. Um, and clearly, you know, they've got as as times progress, they've got more understanding about this, um, and you know, also starting to develop things like for um, chemo protection and for um, transmission blocking. So, um, and and as you say, <clears throat> you know, the field you know, the, ha, has progressed. They now know that you know there is a target for a single dose treatment, which is, is a very high bar. Um, but but yeah, I get. But yeah, you want to have have the the best if you like, don't you? Um, and you know the, the quality of compounds it, it, that, that they have in their portfolio is 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 very good. But like in everything else, as Ben said, you know there is a nutrition rate, um, and that, and even when you get a compound into the clinic, there's still a very high attrition rate. Thank you very much. We do have few questions coming in. Uh, however, we have run out of time. Uh, absolutely, it was a pleasure listening to you. Thanks a lot. Thank Going you very much. To, um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Laurie Ferenc. Dr. Ferenc is currently a research associate professor at Northeastern University. And her research is focused on a drug discovery for neglected tropical disease. Uh, she is presently leading three projects uh, which focus on repurposing of known human kinase inhibitors for use against parasites responsible for diseases like malaria, chagas, leishmaniasis, etc. Dr. Lowry did her uh, doctoral work at Monash Institute and uh, has also been involved with International Younger Chemist Network, the IYCN, since early 2017. First, as chair of the public outreach subcommittee, and then as the vice chair of the organization. Uh, she will be focusing on one of the parameters that is aqueous solubility. We just heard uh, Professor Ian, uh, Ian Gilbert that this is one of the key parameters and how do we build uh, solubility uh, in our uh, chemical scaffolds. So over to you. Thank you very much for the opportunity today. Um, can I just confirm you can hear me and see my slides? Yes, we hear you and we see the slides well. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, I think that Ben and Ian have both set me up really well actually today to talk to you about the optimization of aqueous solubility for a series of compounds. Okay, so... Just briefly, um, I wanted to touch on today, just... Uh, if I may interrupt, may I request uh, everyone to mute their... Yeah, thank you so much. Please continue. Thank you for that. Okay, so uh, before I jump into this, what I wanted to do was to just very quickly uh, talk about the differences uh, in terms of thermodynamic versus kinetic solubility measurements. 
Um, the data that I'm going to be sharing with you today is, is all thermodynamic solubility data. And so I think it's important that we just establish kind of what, what that actually means. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a, a graph that I created. Um, so apologies, there's a reason that I'm in science and not art. Um, but on our y-axis here, we have the drug concentration, and then on our x-axis, we have time. And so effectively, what we're doing is uh, with a thermodynamic solubility assay, we're starting with a low concentration of drug, and then we're actually uh, measuring the uh, equilibrium concentration uh, over time. Kinetic solubility is really about, is a compound likely to precipitate out of solution? So it's kind of the opposite scenario. So with a thermodynamic assay, we're taking our solid drug, we're adding it uh, in excess to our excipient, and then we wait for it to equilibrate and then measure. Whereas with a kinetic assay, our solid drug is actually pre-dissolved in an organic solvent, and then it's added slowly to um, an excipient. Uh, and then when precipitation occurs, that's when we, we have our solubility measurement. So in terms of thermodynamic solubility, uh, I wanted to provide you with some benchmarks. This is what we're thinking about in terms of uh, solubility of compounds. Uh, for highly insoluble compounds, we're thinking about less than one micromolar in terms of solubility. Uh, for poorly soluble compounds, anything kind of one to 100 micromolar and soluble would be greater than 100 micromolar. Okay, so strategies to improve solubility. I am a medicinal chemist. So it's my role in this process to really think about structural modifications that we can make to compounds in order to improve the solubility. Um, this is everything that Ben and Ian alluded to earlier in terms of trying to make sure we can improve our compounds. So in terms of the medicinal chemist's toolbox, we have a number of different strategies that we can use. Uh, we can think about reducing the lipophilicity. Ian mentioned that in his presentation just before. Uh, we can think about the addition of ionizable groups. We can make out of plane substitutions. We can reduce the molecular weight. Uh, we can add hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. Uh, and we can also make prodrugs. Uh, and I'm sure that there are also many other modifications that we can also make too. That's as a medicinal chemist speaking. Uh, there are certainly other avenues to actually improve solubility. Uh, for example, we have colleagues who are formulation scientists. Uh, we can think about different drug delivery systems like nanoparticles, uh, drug complexation, uh, as well as many others that I, I haven't mentioned here today. Um, but really what I wanted to focus on today is, is three strategies that we uh, had uh, mi mixed success, I'm going to say it's mixed success, uh, in terms of improving the solubility of a chemical series that we were actually working on. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about reducing the lipophilicity or the impact of lipophilicity on solubility, uh, the addition of ionizable groups, as well as out-of-plane substitutions. Okay, so uh, this project, just as a little bit of background, uh, started out as a, a kinase inhibitor repurposing project. So we took lopatinib, which is a known human EGFR inhibitor, um, and that was actually tested and identified as a hit compound or a starting point for human African trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness drug discovery. So lopatinib here, um, we initially started out with nine compounds that were gifted to us from GSK. Uh, T. brucei is, is the parasite that causes uh, human African trypanosomiasis. And so this is really what we're going to be benchmarking. And in a moment, I'm going to switch to some uh, traffic light color coding um, so that you can follow along. Uh, but here we've got a compound. It has low micromolar inhibition of the, the parasite of interest. Um, we don't have very much selectivity. Uh, our hep G2, um, it, we're still seeing quite uh, active quite potent activity even against hep G2 cells. Uh, so our initial efforts actually focused on this, this tail region, I'm going to call it. Um, we generated a virtual library. Uh, we made sure we really filtered that virtual library, thinking about properties, thinking about how could we uh, you know, remove the, the furan in particular, which is a no metabolic liability. And we actually arrived at NEU369. So we've now maintained our potency against T. brucei. 
but we have significantly improved our HEP G2 uh, selectivity window. So 44 analogs, three cycles of structure activity relationships later, uh, we arrived at NEU 617. Uh, so here you can see we haven't really made too many structural changes at this point. It's really all been con concentrated around this region of the compound. So NEU 617, we have uh, T. brucei activity now has significantly imp increased. We've maintained our HEP G2 activity. And so our overall selectivity has gone up. It was actually at this point in the program where AstraZeneca joined uh, and was providing us with an in-kind contribution. They measure tier one ADME data for us on every compound that we make and their uh, contribution to our research is invaluable. So tier one ADME data is thermodynamic aqueous solubility. Uh, we get log D, human liver microsomal clearance, rat hepatocyte clearance and human plasma protein binding. So, Again, a number of those parameters that we've had talked about already today from our previous speakers. So here we are, we're at NEU 617. We have a compound that really isn't very soluble at all. And, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Um, we then identified, uh, so this, this region here that I'm highlighting with the red box, uh, this is our what we call the head group of lapatinib. It's responsible actually for the exquisite selectivity of lapatinib for EGFR. Uh, in terms of the, the kinase activity. Uh, it's also where we found there to be flat SAR. It's a very lipophilic region and we, we really wanted to actually explore what we could do in this space. So several, several things happened at once. We did a scaffold hopping exercise. We were thinking about, you know, can we improve uh, on the, uh, on, can we improve at all in terms of our potency, uh, in terms of our properties? Uh, we also really wanted to focus on truncating that head group down uh, so that we could, again, kind of, kind of coming back already a little bit towards you know, uh, reducing the molecular weight of our compound. And you can see we were somewhat successful. Uh, so our aqueous solubility is up. We're still in the poorly soluble range. Uh, we did take a hit in terms of our potency against the parasite. Um, but we have maintained excellent selectivity against Hep G2 cells. And so it was at this point in the project uh, that we were really thinking about how can we improve the aqueous solubility of this, this, this scaffold. Um, and you can see uh, this, this story or elements of it um, we published back in 2019. Uh, and so you're more than welcome to, to go there and, and take a look. <clears throat> Um, but effectively what we did was we broke the compound down. Sorry, we broke the compound down into a series of regions, which I've highlighted with very colorful colors. Uh, you can see here in purple, um, <clears throat> this piprazine. We really wanted to think about, you know, can we introduce ionizable groups at this point? Can we maybe add on an acid? Um, thinking about increasing our sp3 carbon content, making out of plane substitutions, uh, increasing the flexibility of the system. Uh, and so for us, going from the piprazine to the homopiprazine was a logical solution or um, opportunity to try. Uh, at our linker region, this pyrimidine, we actually thought about introducing an NH linker. Uh, so again, it, adding a site, uh, a basic nitrogen and ionizable group potentially. Uh, we thought about with our pyrazine head group, can we uh, increase our sp3 content at this place, at this position? Um, and can we also start to think about introducing orthomethylation? Can we try and pucker this spring system so that we're not stacking quite so well in terms of our crystal packing? Um, and as an extension, we also thought about the same strategy and applying this to our core scaffold by actually installing orthomethyl groups here uh, again, to try and, and cause a puckering of the structure and impact our crystal packing. So I'm going to walk through these um, quickly. Uh, obviously, there was a, a lot of compounds that were made as part of this endeavor, uh, and certainly not all of them are successful, and I haven't shown you all of the structure, uh, all of the approaches that we took here even. Uh, so I'm more than happy to speak to anyone um, after, should you wish. Okay, so initially we were thinking about reducing the lipophilicity of our series. 
Uh, and while I'm not really showing you anything uh, concrete here, what I did want to demonstrate here, so we have two plots. Uh, our first on our y-axis for both is our aqueous solubility. Uh, along the x-axis is either C log P on the left or log D on the right. So I think it's important to look at both in the context of this uh, series uh, because we do have basic centers. And so there could be dis differences um, between, between these two values. So typically what we would expect is as we reduce our lipophilicity, our uh, solubility would be kind of driving up with, we're thinking about trying to be in the top sort of left-hand corner of these, of these graphs. However, that's not what we're seeing. We're not really seeing any correlation between lipophilicity and aqueous solubility. And so for us, lipophilicity wasn't really driving solubility in this series. And so we instead turned our attention to our second strategy, which was actually the addition of ionizable groups to this scaffold. So NEU 1953, this is going to be our starting point for all of the discussions uh, over the next several slides. Um, again, I have color coded um, based on, so T for T. brucei, as well as log P, log D and aqueous solubility. Red or burgundy, if you will, uh, is bad. Obviously, uh, green is good in this case, and orange is somewhere in the middle. So our first strategy uh, had a couple of different elements to it. And, and I think this is one of the points that I wanted to, to stress as we start this sort of journey through um, this series. Uh, every chemical modification that we make along the way has multiple elements to it. So for example, when we go from NEU 1953 to NEU5029, here we are literally just sort of ring opening this piperazine. Um, in terms of addition of ionizable groups, uh, we now have uh, two basic centers. That's not to say that there weren't two basic centers before, but we've certainly altered the basicity of these centers. Um, we uh, have also though increased flexibility in this region. We're now, we now have a lot more SP3 kind of character. There's, there's a lot more movement. And so there, there are other elements along the way that will impact this. And you can also see with our log D value, we've now decreased by one log unit. Um, unfortunately, in general, this strategy wasn't really successful for us. Uh, our T. brucei activity for 5029 was 1.8 micromolar. It did impact solubility in a positive way. Um, although that didn't translate to these acids that we also made, we did also, for clarity's sake, test the esters, uh, the methyl esters, in terms of potency, thinking about whether we might be getting some kind of permeability effect happening, um, but both of those were also inactive. So while the approach did yield some success in terms of solubility improvement, particularly when you think about NEU5029, it really was detrimental for potency um, across the series that we actually made. So next, uh, we thought about, again, kind of coming back to this idea of, can we introduce uh, an ionizable linker, an NH in this case, um, or a, another basic nitrogen? Um, and again, here, so with NEU2140, all we've done is we've tried to retain kind of the, 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 the same substitution pattern, although that does alter the vector dramatically. Um, that did lead to a significant loss of potency against the parasite. We have again reduced our lipophilicity both on the log P and the log D front, uh, and we're seeing an, in, an increase in the aqueous solubility, though that then didn't translate. So when we tried to think about how we could potentially um, you know, mimic perhaps better this, this kind of vector and this orientation, we switched to NEU2094. Uh, we're, we're maintaining our activity. We, we see a twofold loss. Uh, we maintain log P as well as log D, but now our aqueous solubility has uh, tanked. Uh, and a similar story can be seen with NEU2091, where we're now maintaining our potency uh, and increasing our aqueous solubility. But ultimately, this strategy really just proved to be inconsistent in terms of optimizing both solubility and, and potency or optimizing solubility and maintaining potency even. Sorry, you have a minute more, maybe? Quick oh, wow. Whew, I Wait. am going slow today. Okay, I will. No, that's good. We might have to cut down on the questions a bit. That's okay. Yes, Please take sounds good. 
Okay, so in terms of uh, out of plane substitutions, we also thought about how we could potentially pucker our ring systems by introducing these methyl groups. Uh, on our core scaffold, this led to an increase in our HEP G2 activity, uh, as well as reducing our potency against the parasite and didn't really, well, actually negatively impacted our solubility. Uh, for any 4837, we did manage to gain Im improvements in aqueous solubility, but we, uh, uh, as well as maintaining our potency, but really we weren't seeing the improvements that we wanted to see. Um, we also looked at introducing sp3 carbon content in our, our sort of top part of the molecule here. This did maintain or improve potency. Any 4920 is a fantastic example of that. We've reduced lipophilicity, we've reduced our log D, we've increased our solubility. We're now in the millimolar range, uh, though this was typically at the extent at the expense of some HEP G2 activity starting to come in in this, in this series of compounds. So in terms of the status of our program, I feel like there's a slide missing, but that's okay. So one of the things that we really did focus on was actually making modifications uh, to uh, this, this tail region. So this homopiprazine actually gave us a significant boost in terms of the aqueous solubility of our compound, uh, whilst also um, maintaining the potency compared to any 1953. It was purely serendipitous that we actually ended up making this scaffold hop to NEU 4438. Uh, this saw a significant improvement in T. brucei activity. We've improved our log D, our lipophilicity is good. Our aqueous solubility is also excellent. We did take this compound forward into an, an efficacy study and you can see the parasitemia counts here on the uh, Y axis, as well as the number of days uh, post infection on the, the X axis. NEU4438, this compound here is in red, NEU4363 is in green. These compounds, uh, these mice are being dosed orally. Uh, the target product profile for HAT is for an oral treatment. And you can see that uh, NEU4438 with its improved solubility has significantly, has, has uh, a much greater effect on parasitemia than NEU4363. Uh, we also profiled this compound in terms of its kinase selectivity. Uh, and it was very selective. We looked at the genotoxicity and there was none, but there is a HERG liability and that's something that we're really focused on optimizing now. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, tackling uh, solubility and succeeding sometimes. So there is no one size fits all approach and it is time consuming. You have heard that from Ian as well as Ben previously. Um, An interpretation of the data is often complex because we are changing multiple parameters at once. Um, I do need to acknowledge uh, the people uh, who have worked on this series in the lab. So all of our alumni here down the bottom all contributed to this work uh, directly. Our collaborators at the, the now at Kennesaw State University, they were originally at the University of Georgia, uh, they do all of our biology uh, to help drive this program, as well as uh, we're very well supported by the National Institutes of Health. And we have in-kind contributions from AstraZeneca and the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research that I described here. Thank you very much. I am more than happy to take questions. Uh, and if we don't get time for that, please do feel free to reach out to me via email. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. I, um, we have run out of time uh, and it is a fascinating story. I Lots of questions, but I think we should, there are two clarifying questions, which I definitely mm -hmm. would love to address before going ahead. One is, um, can, uh, if you can explain what is out of plane substitution and second is, can you give what is scaffold half thing? Uh, because your last success did come from there. So if you can very briefly give us yes. these two. Thank you. Yeah, so scaffold hopping is really thinking about making changes to this core structure. In this case, we have a four amino quinoline. Uh, and we actually accidentally made this uh, uh, quinolinamine. And so it's really just changing to that kind of like core base structure that we would associate with uh, for, for our scaffold hopping. I hope that that clarifies that question. Uh, and the other one, I'm sorry, has just fled my mind. Out of plane substitution. Thank you very much. So out of plane substitution is really thinking about how can we kind of pucker our structure? How can we introduce 3D shape, get away from flatland, uh, so to speak? So uh, things like in introducing that orthomethyl group, 
um, increasing our SP3 carbon content, all of those things kind of really are contributing to, um, you know, puckering the ring system and, and kind of sort of shifting it out of plane, so to speak. I hope that clarifies. That does. Thank you so much. And thank you for your talk. Uh, the last speaker of today's session is uh, Dr. Kiran Deep Sandhi. Uh, Dr. Kiran Deep Sandhi is currently serving as Open Operational Lead with uh, Medicines for Malaria Venture, MMV. Through the open initiatives, she has supported validation of new targets and identification of new starting points for drug discovery programs by various groups across the globe. Dr. Sambi has 20 years of experience in uh, medicinal chemistry and is a PhD in organic chemistry from Delhi University. Her prior former positions were at Ranbaxi Research Labs and Daichi Sanyo. She is a co-inventor of three IND molecules uh, targeted, at over, uh, targeted uh, for overactive bladder and severe asthma. After spending around 16 years in pharmaceutical industry, Dr. Sambi joined CSIR Intec, a public research institute to establish its medicinal chemistry division. She will take us through uh, some of the antimalarial discovery programs that are currently happening uh, with MMP. Dr. Sambi, welcome. Uh, thanks, Mona Lisa, and uh, uh, thanks uh, to the organizers for providing this opportunity you know, uh, to speak at this workshop, which I which I'm sure is you know, going to be really interesting and uh, helpful to all the participants over here. So uh, during the next 15 minutes, uh, I would be you know, kind of talking about some things uh, which Ben in her talk, uh, Ben in his talk has already covered. And uh, I think the audience also had questions about uh, which is a better approach about phenotypic screening or target-based screening. And uh, to add to that thing that in like in infectious diseases, I would say that, you know, uh, that there has been a paradigm shift from uh, initially for phenotypic screening to target based and then back to phenotypic screening. So what is the, if we are going through with the phenotypic hits, what is the best stage to start with the, you know, kind of target deconvolution activities and is only identification of targets sufficient or there is there are studies which have to be done beyond that but before i you know kind of go into the talk a brief introduction about mmv uh, an has uh, you know uh, multiple times called mmv 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 and uh, uh, for those who are not initiated into what mmv is so it is a not for profit organization based out of Geneva. It's the virtual organization that works with partners like uh, Ian at Dundee uh, to deliver, uh, discover, develop and deliver new and affordable antimalarial drugs. And I mean, as you are aware that uh, <clears throat> malaria is something, you know, is, uh, is not a commercially profitable area. So to work on that and make research happen, MMB shares costs and actually, you know, is a catalyst uh, that is making this research happen on the drug discovery or uh, drug development level. So, uh, if we look at, you know, if we look on the left hand side of the figure, so it, uh, you know, clearly indicates the impact that the uh, development of phenotypic assays in early 2000s have had on uh, how drug discovery has been done. And at MMV, through different partners, there were around 9 million compounds that were screened in various phenotypic assays. And with the success rate of, you know, hit uh, of identification of hits around 1%, uh, they, they, there were more than 30,000 hits that were identified during the course of time. And out of working on these hits, uh, the organization has been able to uh, identify and develop 15 candidates with 15 new mechanisms of action. So now one, you know, and then again, another question, uh, which was probably asked in uh, one of the, you know, uh, to one of the presenters about drug resistance. 
So when you have this kind of uh, a hit rate and the hits, and especially there is a lot of presidents now in malaria, and as we mentioned, that PPPs are becoming stronger. So of course, drug resistance is something which is regularly taken care of. So there are a lot of parasite, uh, parasitic lines that have been generated and maintained, and that is something which I'll discuss also in, in my uh, you know, subsequent slides. Uh, having said so, that most of the hits have come from uh, most of the, I, I would say, the developmental molecules that we are, we, that MMD has right now have come at uh, through phenotypic screenings. But with the advent and, you know, kind of utilization of AI models and machine learning models, we are going back to target-based screening to have, you know, uh, to see that how, how we can improve uh, uh, those, uh, those aspects. Uh, so if you look, uh, if you look at this slide, uh, so, you know, uh, this slide actually you know, clearly shows that uh, there, there are still some molecules which are, you know, as far as we go to phase two, for which the mechanism of actions are still unknown. Uh, starting from, you know, early, uh, I, I would say the preclinical development, of course, you know, and that does not mean that, uh, you know, efforts have not been uh, put in to identify the uh, mode of actions of these uh, compounds. Uh, but the only thing is that that the standard uh, methodologies which have been used till now uh, have not eluded the exact mode of actions or uh, what the targets these compounds are inhibiting. Having said so, um, I mean, uh, for some of the compounds uh, we have seen and we, uh, the groups have been very successful in identifying uh, the targets that those compounds actually inhibit. Having said so, I mean, uh, target deconvolution is something uh, which happens at various uh, stages of the project, and it is independent. I mean, it is very dependent on the project. It is not, you know, kind of uh, one size fits all all the projects. Uh, though, uh, though at MMV, majority of the compounds have been identified from the phenotypic screening. Uh, target deconvolution has taken place at different phases and mechanism of some of the uh, clinical compounds is still unknown. So th this is just to reiterate, reiterate the fact that it is not necessary uh, for a compound to move uh, forward that we uh, must know the mechanism of action. Of course, if you know the mechanism of action or the target to which the compound is finding that actually uh, helps you, uh, you know, push forward. Uh, so, in the in the past past decades, we have seen that a lot of investment in phenotypic drug discovery has happened, and that has also led to you know an increased demand for rapid and robust uh, target deconvolution methods. And on this slide, you see few of those uh, methods that are used worldwide, and not only with with respect to infectious diseases, but other therapeutic areas also. But during uh, in my next slides, I would focus specifically on malaria, that how some of these approaches and, and done in parallel, how these have been helpful to identify our molecules. So if you see the, uh, some of the basic uh, screenings, which are actually the computational, computational predictions, and uh, we have been, uh, the, the groups have been uh, actually very successful in predicting uh, the structures. And if you see the you know, the reference that is mentioned uh, below, it very nicely describes that how these things have uh, supported those things. But as the name uh, suggests that it is a computational prediction. So it is actually, you know, a, a, a predictive tool with, uh, using different predictive tools like FarMapper, ID Target, or Trusted Stock, which actually works on the principle that similar compounds have uh, will bind to similar targets. And when we say that similar compounds, it means that uh, either on the basis of 2D fingerprint, uh, you know, kind of overlap or 3D structures or pharmacophore mapping, uh, the similarity is not known. Coming to the chemical proteomics, and this, again, uh, this is one of the, you know, the most used uh, techniques, uh, whether it is through the affinity binding or protein stability assays, which we call, we also known as the uh, thermal stability assays or ligand directed uh, labeling assays. But one key thing, uh, you know, uh, that has to be remembered in these uh, screens is that 
the tagging which is done, especially in the legal directed labeling or uh, uh, right that tagging that has to be done is uh, the tags should be put in positions uh, where it does not adversely affect the activity or the you know various uh, uh, parameters like solubility or permeability. For the infectious diseases, uh, resistance generation has been one of the key uh, a key techniques, you know, to identify the mechanism of resistance and then kind of, you know, uh, figuring out whether the mechanism of resistance is actually also the mechanism of action for those compounds. And the, uh, and the techniques uh, highlighted in black, you know, uh, transcriptomics and biomarker profiling or morphological profiling are mainly the techniques used to identify non-protein targets like DNA, RNA, lipids, or metal ions. So, as I mentioned, that majority of the hits that or the compounds that have been developed, at least in the field of malaria, have been through phenotypic screenings. Uh, so it is, you know, it becomes essential uh, to link these phenotypic hits back to their function. And one such consortium is uh, MALDA, uh, which is funded by the Gates Foundation and has 13 partners, uh, which actually works on the principle of collaborative drug research, research so that there is no duplication of efforts. And each of these institutes have their own you know, kind of domains where they work. And some of the, uh, some of the techniques that they use to identify various uh, mechanism of actions or target deconvolution techniques are in vitro evolution, which till now is the mainstay of you know, infectious diseases. And then once the resistance is generated, you uh, try to analyze uh, through the whole genome sequencing those uh, resistant mutants, conditional knockout studies, uh, identification of barcoded cell lines or overexpression cell lines, which again points out to a mechanism of resistance. And then of course, metabolomics, lipidom uh, lipidom lipidomomics studies followed by in vivo resistance selection. So in, you know, uh, to explain some of the techniques and how, whether, you know, you need to sequentially do these things or these things can be done in parallel. I, I have taken an example of a series that we are working on in the Malaria Leap project, which is an open platform for anti-malarial research. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, th this is the website where, you know, actually you can uh, go and have a look at uh, what is being done. And all the hits that were, have been put into this uh, project are, of course, uh, the phenotypic hits. And uh, we are in the process of, at a very early stage, we have had Im immense interest from various you know, groups outside the MALDA platform to uh, support the deconvolution of these targets. And of course, there are multiple opportunities uh, still open uh, for you know, contributing to the project. So, the story starts with this cycloprofilamide, which was, you know, which was kind of identified as a subseries from a larger series. And the mechanism of action, of course, was unknown since it is, you know, from the phenotypic screening hits. But what really put us thinking was the slow rate of uh, kill in the in vitro uh, PRRSS, which is the, uh, sorry for the typo, parasite reduction rate show assays, uh, which, you know, kind of, uh, made us think that whether it would be uh, worth pursuing these uh, uh, compounds further or not, because the if it is associated with a slow rate of kill, the chances of developing resistance increases. But then the compounds had an attractive uh, liver stage activity along with transmission blocking activity. So very early on, we uh, started, you know, kind of this target deconvolution studies with this compound just to see that we are not hitting any of the targets which are not the recommended targets, or we are, we are able to identify the exact mechanism which can you know, kind of help us take a go-no-go -no -go decision on this, on this scaffold. So um, we, uh, though this, uh, you know, the work was initiated at very early stage, but all these four things mentioned in vitro screening, metabolomics, and in vitro resistance generation and target validation was initiated simultaneously. The first essay which, uh, to which the compound was put was profiling in the barcoded pool. And uh, the principle for this essay uh, 
is that there are barcodes using CRISPR-Cas9, uh, CRISPR-Cas technology into various parasite lines, which some of them which are mentioned over here. And uh, the drugs are treated at a selective pressure of three into three times the IC50, and the growth is monitored for around 14 days. So this is a pool of 50 cell lines. And in the drug treated pools, if you see that there is a survival of parasites, so those you know those those uh, those uh, cell lines are actually uh, 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 taken for amplification of barcode and further sequencing to identify what exactly the mechanism of resistance is. But what we observed with uh, this compound was that there was no 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 resistance observed with this compound, so we could not actually identify the mechanism of resistance for this compound. Following this, uh, we uh, at MMV, we, there are standard cell lines, some of them which are mentioned on the, you know, on the lower part of the, of the uh, table are the clinical cell lines, and on the top are uh, cell lines which have a, you know, as a base cell line of DD2, which is again a resistant cell line. Uh, for uh, the, these cell lines are resistant to specific, um, you know, specific mechanisms of action, but which so that it helps us identify whether these compounds have this show any cross resistance to these cell lines or not. And what an interesting, uh, we received, you know, really got an interesting uh, 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 results in this that what we uh, saw was that. Uh, in one of the resistant cell lines, which is uh, which is a BC1 a compound Etowa Quinn, and uh, you know one of the commercially available uh, compound used for treatment of malaria, the compound is shows hypersensitivity in that strain. So basically, when when I say that it shows hypersensitivity, it means that though in the sensitive cell lines, the compound had an IC50 of around 160 nanomolar, it was eight times more potent against this strain. Uh, indicating uh, that BC1 may be one of the modes of action for this compound. Simultaneously, uh, the group at uh, Monash uh, was also, you know, uh, performing the metabolomic studies. And before performing the metabolomic studies, they had done uh, uh, they had done a blood stage activity in various stages of the blood parasite to understand you know, at what stage this metabolomic studies should be done. And at this stage, Atovaquin was, you know, kind of taken as a control. And it was seen that at five times the IC50 concentration, uh, the parasite pyrimidine metabolism was perturbed. And metabolites which were upstream of the DHODH, uh, in, uh, DHODH were accumulated in the compound-treated parasites uh, while uh, downstream uh, metabolites were depleted, which indicated that uh, these, uh, this compound may have an uh, electron transport chain as one of the mode of action. Uh, and it was still not clear. You know, the, that, we, uh, we are almost out of time. So uh, if you can bring about the major messaging, that will be helpful. So, so uh, I'm gonna, uh, just uh, I have only two more slides uh, which I need to present. So sure. it was indicative of DHODH or BC1 inhibition, and uh, this was further confirmed. You know uh, that whether it is a DHODH inhibition or BC1 inhibition by using SB1A6 parasite line, and uh, this parasite line is one which is actually resistant to all the known. Uh, BC1 inhibitors. But what is also observed is that the moment uh, proguanil is added, uh, the sensitivity is uh, the sensitivity to the, uh, the compound BC1 inhibitors is retained. So this data shows chloroquine, which is not a BC1 inhibitor, works both very similarly in both the cell lines, while atovaquin and 4508 actually show a loss in activity, which is you know kind of regained. When uh, you see uh, uh, when when the uh, when the cell lines was treated with uh, around one micromolar of proguanil, indicating that it does target parasite BC1, and which was further confirmed by you know kind of target validation uh, by screening the compound in both uh, uh, biochemical assays for the DHODH, where it was inactive, and you know in the mitochondrial ex extracts. Uh, uh, plasmodium uh, mitochondrial extract around very similar activity to spot we saw in the whole cell activity. And further a generation of resistant mutants and co-crystallizations has been learned. But this, act, this, you know, this has actually brought the project back online 
indicating that since the compound is not resistant to the tobacquin or commercially available compound resistant, it doesn't show cross resistant to those cell lines. So there is the potential of you know, working further on these uh, series of, the, of compounds. So just to conclude that they, uh, both phenotypic screens and target-based screens have their pros and cons. Uh, but you know, at which stage the target con deconvolution has to be developed is very project dependent, but it multidimensional approaches have to be taken to actually conclude uh, that what exact mechanism of action or a target uh, of the compound is. And in addition to in addition to identification of target, target validation is equally important. And of course, uh, you know, all of us understand that target identification of phenotypic hits can actually help us in rational design. Um, Thank you Hi. so much. We really need to move on because I think we are out of time. It was absolutely fascinating to see all the different methodologies that are being used. I have been very closely associated with Malda, brings back my time with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the amazing work that the team is doing. Unfortunately, I don't know if we had, we could take, uh, there is one critical question that came in. If you have a very briefly, there was a question on how much of CRISPR-Cas technology is being used, and you already demonstrated an example, although not probably not the most um, successful one, but can you shed just a light how much of it is in use and in which ways in malaria, early target decorporation or alternative methods? Yeah, I think uh, CRISPR-Cas, uh, one of the key things has been used to, you know, uh, like I mentioned, uh, the work that has been done at Sanger Institute in I, generating the barcoded uh, files and uh, uh, barcoded cell lines to identify. And that has been, though in this case, uh, I would say that this was not a very, you know, appropriate example uh, for identifying the mechanism of resistance, but if we see uh, in R, because this, this, this essay is actually one of the key determinants in our hit identification screen. So we have been actually able to rule out a couple of compounds uh, uh, that do not, you know, that, that show cross resistance to targets which we really do not want to work on. So that, that, is, that, that is definitely one of the ways which I can say is, has been very useful. Other question, I think, is since you have been um, leading a lot of open, uh, you know, discovery programs, can you share like how people can contribute or be part of it, or what have your your major learnings be when you run an open discovery program? I think that that's a very important question. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, as you have seen in this presentation, uh, we have seen major contributions coming in through biology, and especially, you know, for the biologists point of view, it becomes very, you know, attractive if they could lay their hands on some new uh, scaffolds or compounds where they can actually uh, target deconvolution is one of the things which they can do, or, you know, kind of screening in clinical isolates or uh, standardize their essay, other, uh, you know, validate their essay systems. But there are multiple ways in which uh, groups can actually contribute. And of course, one of them is uh, medicinal chemistry, not only synthesis, but also, you know, design of uh, molecules. And uh, of course, uh, if I talk specifically with the Malaria Lee project, there is a core team that, uh, you know, kind of prioritizes these molecules. And we, uh, and we have had groups, you know, uh, who are, of course, that was not a part of this discussion, but who are doing a lot of computational work at the back end to understand, you know, uh, that what, what, what compounds to prioritize or what things to be uh, done. So all those activities are there uh, which in which various groups or participants can join in. And you know if if the participants in the today's forum have some specific questions, so the I'm sure this presentation is going to be shared, uh, but uh, they would have uh, seen the uh, email ID where they can actually you know kind of put their thought process, what they would what they think about the project and or how they'll you know kind of uh, uh, become part of the uh, the larger community which we have built for this project thank you so much and uh, we would have loved to continue our conversations but we really have run out of time i thank all the speakers for uh, sharing their insights knowledge spending time with us 
few uh, few reflections uh, from today's session. It's we have covered a lot of ground. It's just absolutely impossible to uh, to summarize early discovery, to even summarize lead optimization, or even run through a, a specific case study in ninety minutes. It, it's just it's just amazing what speakers have been able to do today. They are provided as a glimpse. I hope you all agree. They are provided as a glimpse of what early discovery all means, what does it take, how intense is then effort, and why do we not succeed at success rates are so slow, so uh, small. We saw Ben's incomplete uh, list of uh, property attributes that need to be, uh, uh, to be optimized. We went through um, Ian's uh, case study where we really saw potency optimizations, we saw Laurie's physical chemical property optimization, ADME property optimization, we saw safety signals popping in, which then needs to get addressed. Um, uh, and uh, I think the challenge is how do we, and you also saw times when we have a very soluble compound, it leads, loses potency. If you have a very potent compound, it comes up with a safety signal. So how do we do that multi-parametric optimization and that continues to be in a particular single molecule that ultimately will become your candidate drug that will be taken up for preclinical assessments and your tox package. The other thing we really saw and what we got a glimpse of is the collaborative effort. Um, I mean, either, it's, it, either it is collaborations uh, with different uh, functional groups within an organization or collaborations across different organizations. You also saw open research uh, discovery programs, as well as programs that get, uh, you know, developed in a, uh, in a drug discovery unit like Dundee and then handed over to big pharma like Merck. So I think uh, every player has, every function and discipline has a role to play in drug discovery. And discovery is just a start. Uh, to take the molecule ultimately to a patient, it has go, have to go through the entire development process through its preclinical, clinical, and then launch. So it is a long journey. It is a resource intensive journey. And what we heard is, what has taught to us always is fail early and build differentiated molecules. How do we fail early? I think a good failure is when you have really robust assays so that what you gen data that you generate is actually um, gives you confidence that this is what I would need to deprioritize. I think that's a big win when you really have solid evidence to say, hey, I'm going to deprioritize the series because of certain real strong rationale, you really have made space to build, bring in other scaffolds that could have be a better candidate for the discovery program. And uh, this just uh, leaves me to thank all the organizers, as well as thank all the participants who have stayed with us for the last one and a half hours, uh, and uh, for your questions and for the speakers. Thank you so much. And Amit, I think we have five minutes to go, so we are good with the time. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, thank you, Dr. Uh, Manalisa Chatterjee, for summarizing the session uh, for everyone very beautifully, um, and even for non-science uh, people like me. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I would request uh, uh, our esteemed speakers uh, to please turn on their cameras so that uh, we can take a photo op. Dr. Bitsman, yeah. Ben, if you are there, um, Dr. Laurie, um, I can see Dr. Kirandeep, um, Professor Ian. Yeah. I see Thank them. You. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Thank yep, so you. I see everyone. Again. Yeah, okay. So I would request the team to kindly of take a photograph. I'll, I'll turn off my camera. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are we good team? 
Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. So thank you so much and uh, all the best for the day too. Uh, I'll hand over to the next team. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A gentle reminder from our end if you have not yet filled out the uh, uh, mentimeter feedback form please do so at the earliest. Thank you. Thank you.